Thanks for joining me for another edition of this old Gibson. This one's a 1959 ES125T and it has really high action. I have a couple videos out on YouTube already where I've reset the neck on some 60s models which are a TC and they have a cutaway over here. Oh wow, look at all that dust. But this one is a 59 and look at the patina on that. Boy oh boy. Not too shabby. Anyways, like always, the action's high and I've raised this up a little bit to where I kind of where I want it, where the strings are about three quarters of an inch above the body. And my action is at 13 64ths, which is kind of crazy. That's 0 0.203 of an inch and or five millimeters. Good Lord, it's approaching a quarter of an inch action height at the 12th fret. So I did a couple more of these. Like I was saying, I've got a couple videos and but the last one that I did, I did not film or make a video and I've come up with a little better technique, make for a little cleaner neck removal and uh, just a much easier method of uh, approaching one of these uh, neck reset jobs. So I'm going to take you along on this one and let you see what happens. Also, the electronics are really messed up. Someone put in these two-way switches or they ordered them from the factory this way and they're not doing anything and this tone is not doing anything and it's really stiff. Uh, actually, the volume is really stiff too. I don't know if some contact cleaner would help, but I'll end up pulling all the electronics out of here and I'll show you the whole thing. When I get a guitar into the shop, I work up all the measurements. I check the relief in the neck. I check the action, which is like I said, 13 64ths. I check the string gauge, the intonation, which is way too sharp. The fret size, they're 37 thousandths of an inch tall through 40 thousandths through frets 1 through 12 and 45 thousandths of an inch way up high where he, the player wouldn't be playing very often. And so the frets are higher up above so it kind of gives the illusion that it's got a ski jump going. My neck reset notes. The first measurement you take or you decide is how much you want to lower the saddle to give you the proper string height. My string height at the 12th fret is 13 64ths and I want 4 64ths. That's a difference of 9 64ths. But my measurement for the neck reset is not 9 64ths, it's 9 30 seconds, which is double the amount of 9. So you have, you have your 9 30 64ths, you want to use 9 30 seconds as your amount to lower the saddle. Double the amount that you want to lower it at the 12th fret. Okay, that's the most confusing part about figuring out how much to take off the heel. So once you figure that out and you write it down in decimals, 0.2183, and then we have the length of the heel, which is a really short one because it's a real thin line body, 1.875. Multiply those two and divide it by the 12th fret to the saddle distance, which is 11 inches. It's pretty much the same on all these 11 inches. That gives me 0 0.0372. That's the amount I'll want to remove from the heel and we're going to remove material from the heel in a wedge shape like this. So it's one millimeter here and it's zero here. We're not taking any material off right here. We're taking it all here in a wedge shape. And that's a good start. Take the one millimeter off, put it back together and see how the strings line up. It's important to save the old strings for now. I'll end up taking the neck on and off and restringing it several times before I commit to gluing it up. So I want to keep these. I'll probably end up breaking the high E string as normal. And it's a weird string gauge. I mean, it's an unusual gauge. It's a 12 through 53 with a plain G string not a wound G-string, just a plain G-string. I usually only keep one pack of these 
strings in stock at any time, so I don't want to break my new strings, taking it out and off and restringing it. So that's why I'm saving those. Now I've got a little situation. The old output jack seems to be seized up. It seems to have never been taken out. Nobody's ever gotten that thing out of there. I've gotten all the other electronics loose and dangling around inside. There was a little problem with the uh, end pin. A little problem with the end pin <laughs> coming out. I don't think that's the way they did these. I could be wrong, but I think they used the metal one with a screw. That's the ground wire. We're going to have to maybe plug this and uh, put in a new metal end pin. But the output jack is a little problem. Well, that was scary. What I was able to do is... Uh, get these long hemo steps in through the F hole and kind of jam it in against the jack and then I took a so hot soldering iron and set it in there until it started bubbling. I put some WD-40 in there and uh, once I saw the bu WD bubbling up I just turned it and uh, eventually boom the nut came off but it was scary. So here it is in all of its glory. I like to label everything with an arrow going towards the nut. Got my pickup cover labeled. The pickup is labeled. The toggle switch on the base side of the guitar was wired up to the pickup, so get that would be a kill switch. And the other toggle on the treble side was hooked up to the tone pot, which has a bumblebee capacitor. Uh, what would that do? I've never seen that before, but either way these pots are not even moving and the output jack you know the threads are shot on it and it desoldered itself during the whole process the original ground wire it's a long ground wire it was pushed through the outside of the guitar and soldered onto the tailpiece but that popped right off so what I'll do is I will take the neck off and reset it and as the glue is curing I like to wait a week before I restring a guitar after a neck reset. Let the glue cure nice and slow. It's fish glue. I'll uh, rewire this, these electronics and test them out on the bench. Next, I score this line right here. This is where the fretboard meets the spacer. Sometimes the lacquer chips. So we'll do some touching up. Then I'm going to come in and score this little line. Flip it over and score this side. Note that chip was already there. I didn't do that. Ooh, that's hard to see. On my previous ones, I've noticed they've they put a lot of glue in between the side and the heel. So I started cutting away at the heel, trying to separate that before I uh, get the heat going. I was going to take a millimeter worth of uh, material off the heel as it was so this kind of gets me a head start and uh, helps the neck come off another thing I do is I put paste wax all around the whole deal the whole neck joint before I apply steam, I think it helps deflect some of the steam away from the lacquer and it fills some of the little cracks in the checked aged lacquer, kind of uh, so that the steam can't get down underneath the lacquer. Uh, pull these two frets 
and then uh, create a couple holes right here. I want to come about three eighths to a half and a half of an inch inward from the edge with my holes. And I'm going to go straight down with my holes. Now I'm going to take a guitar string and just put it in there and uh, definitely can hear that there's a big pocket going on there. So I'll do the same thing on this side and then the trickiest part is really getting this fretboard extension off that spacer. We'll go downstairs for that. Definitely hit the pocket uh, both sides and I'll do the guitar string thing again over here to show you. And we'll also take a close measurement just to see. Yep, half inch on that side, half inch. So half inch from either side, straight down, maybe at a slight angle. And uh, the one thing when you have a big pocket, when you find a big pocket, I'm a little weary about using the hot foam cutters on when there's just a huge space of air down in there. Um, I kind of think that steam's going to work better when there's a big pocket of air getting that steam all circulate, circulating around everything and then tilting the you know, holding the neck and the vise and then moving the body around so that it finds its way into all these little areas is probably going to be our best bet. Got the iron on like medium low. Got two layers of protection. I'm going to leave it on here for six, seven minutes. I'm going to keep my eye on it because the fretboard is radiused and the iron is not. We need a radiused iron is what we need. Okay, now I'm coming in with the seam separator. Get right underneath there and push it in. Once I get the edge to lift, I can switch over to a, to a putty knife and a little dead blow hammer and start giving it a few taps. But I think I'll put the heat back on for another four or five minutes first. Another thing that makes a lot of sense to me is to take the uh, spatula and get it hot. I've already got the putty knife started. The treble side's a little looser than the base side. That hot spatula cuts through the glue line. There. Easy does it. Don't want to put too much muscle into this because you could slip with a sharp object and uh, poke someone's eye out. Or you could break the wood. You don't want to break the wood, man. I got this uh, putty knife method from um, one of the Stumac videos. He was taking a fretboard off of Rickenbacker. He was coming in from the nut side doing this. I tried it on the next uh, fretboard that I had to remove and it worked so good I thought I'd give it a try on one of these things. And it works great. Um, again, I can get this thing hot. Hold it right on there. That way I warm up that glue line as I go. Once I get it all the way into the very end, I know that it's loose because um, 
the joint is right there at that fret. So I'm within a quarter inch of it being loose and come in sideways with one of these. Just double check. But that's it. That's the hardest part. Yeah. It's loose now. Holy crap! I just vacuumed up, up the, the dot inlay. Luckily I was using my shop vac that didn't have a bag in it and I was able to retrieve it from there. Holy moly, I almost lost that. If I was using my other shop vac, it has a bag inside. I don't think I would ever found that. Because it was, uh, that, that other vacuum is full. Okay, I tilted the guitar down. I put a rag inside the body. I'm ready for some steam. Seem to be going down as far as I'd like it to. I think I might drill a little more. Hasn't seen the light of day since 1959. And it really took, I'd say five or six second, or five or six sessions at uh, 30 seconds each time. And we can see a little blushing. So I wasn't able to kind of get in there and keep waxing it like I would have liked to. I had to put a lot of pressure on there and it ended up it never actually made it all the way down to the uh, to the bottom of the dovetail. You can see right here that that little piece of the dovetail is still down inside. Other than that, it's pretty good. I've never seen that um, truss rod anchor in one of these models before. I did see it in a 1948 SJ200 one time. They had a multi-piece neck and that sucker delaminated all over me. But anyways, yeah, there it is. The 60s models have it anchored deeper in somewhere, not way out here into the dovetail space. But I'm going to have to clean up that hide glue while it's still hot and uh, check back in a minute. And this stuff, it kind of doesn't seem like hide glue. It's kind of stretchy. It's kind of like wood glue. Hmm. Anyways, I dug out that little piece from the from the from the pocket. I'm gonna glue it back onto the dovetail. Right now, I'll put it with the uh, the inlay that fell out in that little baggie, so I don't lose it. Oh. This was kind of a tricky glue up here. Um, what happened was on a previous repair at some point, the uh, neck block and side came loose from the back and the string pressure kind of or string tension kind of pulled the side and neck block away from the back making a, creating a kind of a gap and someone went in there and put a bunch of glue in there it was kind of a white glue and that's why i kind of saw two different kinds of glue on coming through that that dovetail um the dovetails right down in there i've got these two long bar clamps first thing i had to do was set up a system to uh to de-glue everything and then get a bunch of hot high glue in there i got the two long bar clamps hockey puck for traction down here on this end and then uh, two cam clamps and a uh, another short bar clamp to hold the neck block to the back so these two clamps pushing the body back into the shape that it was originally in so it lines up with the back so the sides line up with the back finally. Now I can put the binding back on and uh, have everything line up correctly and then set the neck. So yeah, it was a it was a trip. I'll put a still photo in here of the uh, apparatus I came up with to uh, heat everything and de-glue it. 
Well, that was a couple hours of work just uh, prepping the area for this new binding. I love how this total vise holds the guitar body in, an, in a way where I can work on the binding here. Um, there's just no way I was going to film all this, but I got a new piece of binding that goes from here to here. You'll see it after the tape comes off. And everything's nice and aligned now. I had, had to do all that before I start shaping the neck heel, you know. This correction that I made realigning the parts could be enough to set the neck in, in the angle that we want it to be in without uh, taking off that full millimeter off of the heel. Here's the heel. So I still have some trimming to do either, either way and I got that piece to glue back on. That's what I'll do. I'll do that next. Next, I fit the male portion of the dovetail into the female portion. I've got the carbon paper taped in because it didn't want to it didn't want to let me do what I wanted to do. See that little gap right there? And watch that close. Give it a little wiggle. Get it off of there. I see one spot. Take it over to the bench. There's the one spot. You know, just kind of scrape it away. And on this one, because I corrected the the sides, I'm going to uh, set up my bench to string the guitar up and see how everything's look lining up. I'm going to do that before I really start shimming. Now that I've got my GPS workstation off this bench, I'll show you how I set this up for a neck setting jig. I've got some thermoplastic calls here. One of them goes into the clamp at the top and it fits right in place. And then this side of the clamp, you just push it down. It's a perfect fit. It's a Harbor Freight clamp. I've got a little call lined with uh, leather here for the bottom of the guitar. And then I've got a call in here somewhere for the ES-125. I think it's this one. Or that might be the Hummingbird. I think one of these small ones works for the ES-125. One of these is going to work. I know I've already used this for this style of guitar. Let me see. And here's the weight bag. You can get these on Amazon. They're uh, for tripods, for weighing down tripods. When the uh, cameraman is in a windy situation, he'll, he'll weigh it down so it doesn't move. And I fill it up with regular old sand. That way I can put the, the guitar on it and it won't, uh, the bottom of the, or the clamp won't scar up the bottom of the guitar. So I'm getting the, my carbon paper. I gotta go find the neck. Here's the neck. Back up this one. This is why I keep the old strings wrapped onto the peg head. So I don't wanna have to use brand new strings at this point. I wanna test it out with the old strings just to see how it lines up. Now I usually use a piece of Dysum right here, which is a sticky stuff, it comes in sheets, and you can use it for opening jars if you have if you have a problem getting a grip on things. It works a lot better than this, just an old latex glove, but it seems to be working for the purpose right now. Next, I put the strings on her. It's one of those rare occasions where I've, not intentionally, but this neck is overset. I put another clamp in there through the pickup hole to keep the ski jump down. It still wants to ski jump even though it's not glued down. 
We've got the secondary bar clamp there holding the neck tight to the body. And I've got all six strings clamp or uh, tuned up to tension. Even though I can't hear the middle ones because they're touching up against my clamps, I can feel that they have full tension. And so this is a these are 12 through 54 strings too. These are these are monsters. Um, another measurement that I can take right now is my neck relief, and this short straight edge, this 12 inch, shows me that I have 10 thousandths of an inch. And so I might want to straighten the neck more, which will make the action even lower, like 2 64ths, which is not good. Uh, that's too low. And my bridge saddle looks too high. I'll tell you exactly how high it is. It's seven eighths. Um, that's not the end of the world, actually. But I think it's adjusted a little much. This is one of the rare cases where I'm going to take material off up here. Instead of down here, I'm going to take material off here. And it's going to bring the neck forward a little bit, which if this was an acoustic guitar would be a problem because I wouldn't be able to just slide the bridge back a skosh to accommodate for that. I'd kind of be stuck in one position, but because this is an arch top with a floating bridge, that'll be just fine. The neck will come forward slightly. The action will go up and the bridge will come down and back slightly. That'll give us the ideal situation. Here I am after making that trim to this area of, of the heel. Um, I've got my string action gauge here. I've got about 4 64ths on the treble side and yeah, about the same on the bass. I don't have all the strings up to tension because I realized without the shims in there, it could pull away a little bit down here. I think I got a I was starting to get a five thousandths of an inch feeler gauge in on this side. The other side's very tight um, on the bottom and the top. So I've lowered the bridge to about three quarters of an inch off of the top of the arch. So it's not ridiculously high anymore. Looks about right. Um, if it looked, I mean, it looks tall which is kind of good. You don't want to go too tall because the Dog Ear P90 pickup does not adjust upward. But I think I'm good now. I'm in the ballpark. I put a, one shim in on... I just I, I made two shims and I stuck them in there loose for now just because it was really... the joint was getting really quite loose. Uh, but it wouldn't go in all the way with both shims. So it's, it's in there right now with just one shim on one side. It's on the base side. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll glue both of these on to the dovetail the male portion of the dovetail and then um, trim it to fit real snug and then we'll be able to glue it up today possibly this is great news here's a look at the uh, shims and how I glue them on with this uh, super glue I just take a little piece of clear mylar and um, hold it and press it in until it cures it only takes a few minutes just kind of hold it in like that Gosh, maybe 20 seconds or something is all it takes. I know the purists really like to use traditional water-based glues and, you know, clamp it up and leave it overnight. That's fine for them. But I... I got this from uh, Brian Kimsey, which, uh, if you go to my channel and you go to uh, my playlists, first you gotta hit go to channel, then you go to playlists, and then you hit show all, 
you can see like all of my head, uh, neck reset videos all grouped together in one playlist. You can find all the bridge re-glues in one, fret work in another, finish repairs for lacquer in one, polyester finish repairs on another. It's There's 25 playlists, but also it, sh it has like awesome channels down at the bottom. You can see those. Brian Kimsey's one of them. Yeah, Ian Hates Guitars, Ted Woodford, Stu Mac, all those guys. Guitar CPR, West Virginia. Uh, so now I can shape the uh, dovetail. I know it's going to be a pretty tight fit, so I just take 80 grit sandpaper and uh, tape it. It's it's uh, adhesive backed sandpaper, and I stick it to a tongue depressor. And this total vice likes to shake around. But I'll do that a little bit on each side, just to thin things down just slightly, and then I'll fit it into the body real quick. Just wipe this area down with uh, acetone, paper towels. I'm going to use hot hide glue on this. It's good and hot. I'm going to put it on the dovetail, uh, both uh, male and female portions. And I'll stick the two parts together. Sometimes when I put these things back together, there's little voids and gaps along the edges. So yesterday I went in with some tight bond um, liquid hide glue and this little brush and just put in a little bead of hide glue to fill all those, those gaps and voids. And then this morning I'm going to wet it a little bit with some warm water. And just make sure that uh, I got all the excess off the edges. And go around the whole joint with that. And then when it dries in a few hours, we'll lay down some lacquer. Okay, so for my second application of to the crack here, I'm going to do a colored coat, some lacquer thinner. Got a little bit of black because I want a dark, dark brown. I don't want a, a, a whole drop, I just want a, like a micro drop. And 
and these mix all colors are opaque pigments. They're not see-through like the this dye that I'm going to use. So I want just a little bit of the opaque. I want to cover something up. I want a little bit, a little more of the brown. And then for the Kalamazoo brown, this is the dye or stain. I get a full drop. See how that mixes in nice. The pigments don't like to mix in as well. There's a little full viscosity lacquer. And then I'm going to try to get everything to blend together right here. It's a nice dark medium, maybe medium to dark brown. And I'm, I'm going to try not to get it on the binding. There's just in between the binding is this area that I don't like the color. I'm just going to drop that in. There's a little spot right there also. That was already there, that chip. I didn't do that. I remember that was already there. Either way, we're dropping this in into this cracked area. We're trying to disguise a little problem area. This is going to shrink back a little bit. So a little spot here I want to hit. Couple spots. I'm gonna make those go away. And I'm not really brushing as much as I'm just trying to drop it in. I'll do the same thing on the base side and drop that in. Careful not to get it on the binding. And there's some little spots over here. I don't like the way those look. got the electronics stuffed back in there but before I did that I did a repair down here let's zoom in okay right here there was another hole just as big as that one where the previous repair guy had inserted one of these and glued it in it was uh, it was ridiculous so what I did was I cut off a piece, I, I drilled it out to fit this dowel. I cut a piece about three quarters of an inch on the bandsaw, maybe it was seven eighths, pushed it in. There was some openings around the edges. I heated this on the heat lamp and packed it in around the edges. This is a touch up stick. It's a it, it gets, you know, when you hold it up to the heat lamp, it gets real chocolatey. And then when it hardens, it becomes uh, pretty hard. And then I scraped it with a razor blade. I wiped on a little bit of the glue, glue boost. And then touched up the color with this here black-brown pen. And then did one more coat of the glue boost. And I just, I just take a paper towel and uh, wipe it on. And that's the thin. And it's turned out really good for a five minute repair that no one's ever going to see because the uh, tailpiece covers it. Tailpiece covers it right up. But I'm going to re-drill and find a vintage style um, strap pin to put in there, strap button. 
Okay, next thing I want to do is get rid of some of this. Oh, if you're wondering how I get the ground wire to come through there, I take a string, I stuff it through, I get it to come out through the pickup hole, and then I solder the two ends together. And then I, when I'm ready to pull all the electronics through, I pull this thing through first. The string doesn't allow it to pull to pull all the way through because it has the ball end. So I can get rid of a little bit of the length of this because it was uh, about 20 feet long. I don't know why it was so long. But I'm going to strip that wire, set it into place, and uh, put the tailpiece back on. Found this one. It looks pretty good. Fits right in the hole. I punched out the center of that hole. Got a little wax on the screw. There. And here's a look at the new the new output jack. Nice and fresh. Fresh and clean. And it's a pure tone jack. Those are the multi-contact type. It's got a real nice fit for the plug. If you don't have you a total vice yet, now's the time to get you one right before Christmas. Maybe a, a little Christmas present for yourself. This is a type on liquid hide. Perfect. Now on top of the colored lacquer, the very last thing I want to do is uh, put this Endurovar, which is a polyurethane. It goes on quite a bit thicker than lacquer. It goes on milky white also. Kind of looks funny. But I tell you, very durable. Dries nice and hard. And it's a nice little treatment right at the end here. It dries clear. After leveling, recrowning, and polishing these frets, we're ready to play her. Oh yeah, so I figured it out. It's got a kill switch. And it's got a tone bypass switch. So if I want like the tone on five, then I want to switch quickly to full bright tone. And there we have it. And the volume is working the way it should.
everything's working right. for watching. Please subscribe, share, and like. It really helps. Take care.